I do want to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. The University Act says that the President shall present, I was interested in reading this a couple of years ago, a report respecting the state of the University and any other matters the President considers important. Well, the President considers that the University of Saskatchewan is important, and that's what he's going to talk about today. I've said on many occasions over the past year and a half, some of you have heard me say this at uh, convocation, some of you many times over, that universities are arguably the most important than they have ever been in their histories, given the world we live in now, and that the University of Saskatchewan is arguably more important now than it has ever been. During that time, a lot has happened in the world, which is why I believed it was really interesting to put together this talk and try to assess what it would be most important to talk about. We're now in the post-truth era, the independent arbitration of what's true and what's not is less available to a public that needs it more. It's not only a Trump-influenced phenomenon, although, of course, that's the most recent and highest profile example. Journalists worldwide, scientists recently in this country and right now in the U.S., writers and scholars globally. I spoke last year at this talk about the Scholars at Risk program continue to face challenges to their autonomy and influence, to their ability to connect with readers, viewers, politicians, thought leaders, and other audiences. And I thought about that, and it struck me that although technologically we live in a more connected world, culturally and politically, we are at risk of living in a less connected one. And this leaves universities and the U of S with a commensurately larger role. Some of you will have seen some reflections on this publicly. Kim Campbell wrote in a February Globe and Mail op-ed, I thought quite astutely, that independently corroborated truth is the cornerstone of two institutions. One is journalism, where multiple verifiable sources are required for a, for a fact to be stated. The other is academia, where peer review in all fields and reproducible experimental results in scientific ones determine what is considered true. Henry Kissinger once famously quipped that all university politics were so vicious because the stakes were so small. I never agreed with the statement, always found it attractive, never quite agreed with it, but it does get a lot of circulation. It's evidently not true now. Now the stakes are so high that we cannot let recent budget reductions shift us from our mission and vision of, and I'll remind you of what's in there, building a sustainable future, of promoting diversity and meaningful change, of serving the public good by connecting discovery, teaching, and outreach, of advancing the aspirations of the people of this province and beyond, of living the values of academic freedom, different ways of knowing, learning, and being, openness, transparency, and accountability, integrity, honesty, and ethical behavior, of inclusiveness, of reconciliation, and of collaboration and connectivity. All of this is in that document that many of you contributed to. I've said that the recent provincial budget will not define us. In this post-truth time, a most unusual one in the lives of all of us here in this hall, we need to ensure that's the case. When these vision, features of our vision, mission, and values document emerged last year, I read them as public commitments to ourselves. That's what I was thinking of when we were putting together that document. I now read them as much more than that, as commitments to what's important everywhere in a time when they are deliberately challenged within, of all places, democracies themselves. What other type of institution in this country could have arrived at the same prescient statements except a university? And what other institution in this country did arrive at these very ones except ours? Universities are needed now more than they have ever been, and the University of Saskatchewan is needed now more than it has ever been. These days I'm dropping that word arguably. 
I concluded last year's GAA speech by saying that in future GAA talks, I would like to build on how the university can imagine its future through the lenses of connectivity, sustainability, and diversity. Moving the U of S thoughtfully into the future will involve all of us using whatever assignments we have to expand the possibilities for connectivity, sustainability, and diversity. Those were the last words I spoke in that speech. This year, I want to make good on that by concentrating on the first of those, connectivity. There have been many temptations, of course, to concentrate on the others for this particular occasion, on sustainability for obvious reasons, on diversity for equally obvious ones, adding a fourth creativity has now created the prism through which our next integrated plan will be projected. But the disconnections of the post-truth era led me to see that connectivity was the one for this GAA. Simultaneously with my introducing these themes last April, connectivity was emerging as a dominant one in the vision, mission, values, early drafts. It's one of the reasons why I was able to talk about it at this time last year. It was already emerging. It reverberated through the thousands of consultations that produced that document. We have a well-deserved reputation for collaboration and for a spirit of discovery, teaching, and outreach. We advance the aspirations of the people of the province and beyond through efforts to share knowledge. We connect discovery, teaching, and outreach and prepare students for enriching careers and fulfilling lives as engaged global citizens. We connect the needs and aspirations of our region with the world's. Connectivity with our many communities pulses emphatically through that document. If we are at risk of living in a disconnected world, replete with immigration orders, Brexits, journalists, muslings, post-truths, intolerance, walls between friendly countries, political ignorance, and defiance of democratic law, the vision document we endorsed last fall tells us that the openness and engagement that's explicit in connectivity is worth talking about today. There are many ways in which, as a university in this country, we are connected. Two years ago, Universities Canada, and I've spoken at Council a lot about that body, it represents all 97 universities in this country. Two years ago, Universities Canada engaged Bruce Anderson, he's formerly of Decima Research and now Abacus, he's a member of CBC's At Issue panel and a regular columnist for the Globe and Mail. Universities Canada engaged him to poll Canadians on their attitudes towards universities. His findings are encouraging for all of us who are involved in university work and reveal that universities are well connected with the public imagination. The value perception of universities is strong, he stated to a Universities Canada meeting in the fall of 2015 and again to our senior leadership forum last summer. We invited him in to speak to us about that study. In Canada, he found 77% of those polled had a positive response to universities, 20% had a neutral response to universities, and 2% held a negative opinion. This contrasts with the United States where a positive view is held by only 47% of the population. In this country, support for universities is equal across provinces, age groups, income brackets, political affiliations. Overall, the takeaway is that Canada is not a society that questions the fundamental value of universities. Quite the opposite. There's a belief that our economy will only remain strong if people receive a university education. So be confident, Anderson told us, and tell our stories. Those findings, Anderson's findings in that poll of the summer of 2015, fall of 2015, parallel what I reported in last year's GAA speech. At about the same time that he was conducting his poll, 90% of people surveyed in Saskatchewan believed we offer students a high quality education. 95 believed we are important to Canada. And 89% believed our teaching and research are beneficial to the community. Those are significant numbers and they reflect a very high level of support and connection. 
In our case, the numbers are gratifying, but not all that surprising, given that we are one of Saskatchewan's largest employers, with over 6,200 people working here full or part-time, and given that our per capita impact on the provincial economy, actually even broader than that regionally, ranks first or second among all 97 universities in the whole country. Something, by the way, that we do continually tell our provincial government. I can tell you that. I have come to work here each day for over 30 years sensing that support, the support that Anderson was finding and the support that we found in our economic impact study, and feeling pretty good about contributing to it in some way or other. And I hope you can all feel that way as well because you are contributing to it. And the work you're doing in that regard is evident, it's clearly evident, far beyond this campus. We are recognized, and I'll quote from that vision document again, as serving the public good by connecting discovery, teaching, and outreach. We're recognized at advancing, as advancing the aspirations of the, of, this, of the people of this province and beyond. Anderson summed up his findings by saying, trust that people share our values, be confident, not defensive, Understand that universities are regarded as good for students, good for society, and good for the economy, and share our stories and powerful statistics. What are some of the stories that we have shared this past year? This is just a sampling. The U of S was awarded $77.8 million by the Canada First Research Excellence Program, the CFREP program. I know that all of you in this room know about that now to lead the Global Waters, Water Futures Research Program. This made us the only university in the country to receive two CFREF awards, the only one in the whole country out of 97 universities. And many, many, many universities applied for one or the other. Many applied for both. We were the only one to receive both. Vito Intervac received funding for Zika virus research to develop a better animal model that researchers say will help them not only understand the infection better, but will help them test new vaccines and drugs. A new $8.4 million Saskatchewan Multiple Sclerosis Research Chair was announced at the U of S. <clears throat> As many of you here know, rates of MS, a debilitating disease of the central nervous system, are the highest in the world in Saskatchewan and in Canada. To lead the research program focused on identifying causes of MS and developing newer improved treatments, the U of S has recruited a renowned MS researcher from the US who will take up the chair position for a seven-year term starting last month. The Saskatchewan Center for Cyclotron Sciences started supplying RUH with radioisotopes in June of 2016, since I gave the last GAA. Prior to that, the hospital received radioisotopes from Hamilton, Ontario. More Saskatchewan patients will now be able to receive PET-CT scans with a supply that comes from the U of S campus rather than from across the country, meaning an earlier start to clinic hours and fewer missed patient appointments due to transport delays or cancellation. An interdisciplinary team of U of S faculty and students has been investigating the declining health of the Saskatchewan River Delta. A University of Saskatchewan PhD student is conducting brain research that could help make brain surgery safer and more effective. This new approach is already helping Saskatoon surgeons plan brain surgeries. Saskatoon, led by the U of S, will host the 2018 International One Health Congress, an event that is expected to bring more than 1,000 researchers and health professionals from around the world to share their research and create new research collaborations. We held our second reconciliation forum, our first internal one, and I know many of you here were there, to measure how far we've come in addressing the TRC's calls to action and to discuss how to continue to improve in this crucial area. The U of S and the library received an historic donation of Inuit art that will be one of the most extensive in this country, and it contains archival material for new research as well. It was an extraordinary donation. Potash Corp's Kamskino program continues to link the U of S math and science students with community schools. Bill Wazer, Professor Emeritus in History, received this year's Governor General's Award for Nonfiction for his book, A World We Have Lost, Saskatchewan Before 1905. Our law college is partnering with the government of Nunavut to deliver a law degree program. I don't know if all of you in this room know that. 
we signed an MOU with the FSIN. U of S was profiled in The Atlantic recently, a very long article read according to their circulation statistics by millions of people outside of this country for our commitment to Indigenous engagement and Indigenous student success. And we're about to be profiled for our Indigenous work in the New York Times. We signed a first in Canada agreement between a university and a symphony orchestra just a couple of months ago. We have designed and created a board of trustees for our Husky Athletics Organization. We received an upgrade to our national sustainability ranking from silver to gold, making us one of only a handful of institutions in this country to have that designation. The U of S and the USSU signed a partnership agreement on campus sustainability initiatives. I like to think that I partnered with them. It had to do in, in part with some of the things that I said at the last GAA, but they really drove it. Three unique in Canada research centers at the University of Saskatchewan were awarded almost $69 million in federal infrastructure funding through the Canada Innovation, sorry, Canada Foundation for Innovation's Major Science Initiatives Program, enabling them to stay at the forefront of international science in protecting human and animal health, developing new medical imaging techniques, and providing critical radar mapping of ele electromagnetic space weather just above the Earth's atmosphere. That uh, was a significant percentage of all the funding available in CFI's Major Science Initiatives Program for Infrastructure, a significant percentage of it that came to this one university. U of S education professor Jay Wilson received the country's most prestigious post-secondary teaching honor, the 3M National Teaching Fellowship. And for those of you who attended last spring's Women of Distinction Awards event, you will know that U of S leaders cleaned up there with the majority of awards going to our faculty, staff, and students. And I just saw today in the Star Phoenix that many of our faculty, staff, and students, and alumni are being nominated again. These are our accomplishments, their connections, of which we can be justly proud. And as I said, that's just a selective list. I only had so much time. Nevertheless, Bruce Anderson said about his poll findings, nevertheless, 63% of respondents believed universities need to change. The poll's findings did not detail what people believe those changes should be. Recent events in the US and the UK, however, and beyond, suggest a growing suspicion, at times a rejection of institutions, particularly institutions regarded as elite, such as traditional media, political parties, machinery, and leadership, and at times, universities. These institutions were often taken by surprise in Canada and beyond Canada. And although we're not seeing it at the moment, we need to guard against the possibility of the same for universities. We can't relax about support from the broader community. We all share the responsibility of communicating what we do and its value. Although we tend to know much of what goes on at universities in all its complexity, the public doesn't and can often be puzzled or bemused by what they read about us. The fundamental errors committed by institutions in any sector that lead to suspicion of them, rejection of them, or a weakening of support for them are these. They don't communicate well, they don't see the need for change, and so they don't plan for it or they don't plan at all. They interpret their past successes as proof of inevitable future successes. They become out of touch with what people actually need of them and how to respond to those needs. Anderson's results show that we are needed. We must ensure that as those needs change, we respond to them. We're at a unique time in the history of post-secondary institutions. We cannot become out of touch. We need to stay connected to understand the larger needs of the communities we serve, the city, the province, this country, the globe, and we need to contribute to them. We must practice, in other words, connectivity. I'm not saying we should compromise our autonomy, and I had to think through this one carefully. 
Universities cannot confuse autonomy with freedom from national, regional, regional, municipal, and global needs and economic realities. We need to preserve autonomy from political and other forms of interference. But we cannot remain insulated from other forces. We need to meet them head on, lead them, constantly adapt to them, stay connected to them. We should govern ourselves not only on the basis of what we want to be, but also what the world needs us to be. Often those two are the same, I know that, you know that. But we need to be listening for when they're not the same. As I remind myself, if you don't like change, you'll like irrelevance even less. What are those realities and how do we need to change? Uh, Yogi Berra once retorted that it's hard to make predictions, particularly about the future. So <laughs> instead of making those predictions myself, let me turn to those who are in the business of making predictions that many people actually listen to. <laughs> On February 6th of this year, Canada's Advisory Council on Economic Growth released its five short reports containing bold ideas that will significantly improve Canada's economic growth trajectory. As much as anything does, those reports identify the changes that lie ahead for Canada and countries like it. I attended an early morning breakfast meeting with the author of that report, Dominic Barton, and half a dozen other university presidents in Ottawa that day after which he spoke at Universities Canada's Converge Conference, attended by university presidents and over 100 students, including three wonderful representatives, students from this university. February 6th was a hurricane day of official presentations and media coverage for Barton. The fact that he chose to start it off with university presidents, followed by a Universities Canada presentation involving students, that was the point of that conference, signaled the importance he places on the post-secondary role in responding to and leading the changes that his report foresees. Canada faces significant economic headwinds, his first report begins, including a rapidly changing population and a stubbornly low level of productivity. In the years ahead, Unprecedented technological change presents a large set of opportunities, but also the potential for significant workforce location. Sorry, dislocation. He went on to state at the conference that 40% of today's jobs in this country will be automated in the next 10 years. <clears throat> Think about that. 40% of today's jobs in this country will be automated in the next 10 years. And actually, I suggest to you that no matter what you do as you go through your day, and I did this just a few days ago as I was traveling somewhere, you start to enumerate the people you are encountering who are working in jobs who very likely will not be working in those jobs in a little while because they'll become automated. And it's not hard to come up with a long list by the end of any given day. 40% of today's jobs will be automated in the next 10 years. That fact in itself caught students' attention, I can tell you that. And it will require new social contracts because skilled workers will be sidelined, and it will also require new educational strategies for preparing today's students for that eventuality. In response, one of his recommendations is to prepare workers for major structural changes on the horizon, such as the automation of jobs, and the growth of the gig economy in which temporary jobs are commonplace and companies tend toward hiring independent contractors and freelancers instead of full-time employees. By 2020, not in 10 years, but by 2020, 40% of the Canadian employed population is predicted to be temporary workers. Our students are still getting jobs and moving into careers at a very high rate. Our statistics tell us that, plus I hear anecdotally all the time, that employers give U of S graduates top priority all over the country and probably beyond. But how can we ensure we, we remain this successful in the future? And how can we ensure we are preparing students for, as Barton called it, unprecedented technological change and significant workforce dislocation? 
One way is to recognize that a university like ours, research intensive, medical doctoral with a unique scientific infrastructure, must seek opportunities for participating in the country's innovation agenda. There is no university in Canada, even if you don't agree with what I just said, there is no university in Canada that has the array of colleges and schools we do, and none with the infrastructure we have. Canada lacks the networks of US labs, state and private, that contribute to innovation. You've got to think about that. I think about it a lot. It's a very interesting point. Such as the National Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and of course the private ones, Microsoft, Apple, Corning, that list goes on. In Canada, universities are mostly it. And of those 97 universities in Canada, the U15 members are really it. The U of S has the variety of programming and research, and it has the faculty and staff and the student talent to develop the best culture of innovation in the country and to benefit our students looking for careers as a result. The communities that we serve, this city, this province, Canada, and countries beyond it need medical isotopes, new vaccines, answers to global water and food challenges, answers to MS and Zika and diabetes. They need us to capitalize on our strength in agri-foods, which was repeatedly emphasized in Barton's reports. They need our philosophers to engage with the enormous ethical issues raised by modern medicine and by IT. I'm just choosing a couple of obvious examples. They need social science scientists to be indispensable parts of the process of digital disruption. They need solutions to carbon emissions, greenhouse gases, clean energy goals, and other critical sustainability challenges. They need answers to urban design and transit issues, population growth, and immigration shifts. They need everyone to work on reconciliation. They need artistic performance and the humanities to provide critical commentary on all of this. We must be listening for these needs, recognizing we must play a significant role in addressing them, maintaining a flexibility in programming and research to do so, and developing ways to engage the many communities we serve that will increasingly depend on us as we move into that era of unprecedented technological change. That is one piece of the connectivity challenge for us. It requires connecting our student and faculty and staff talent with digital disruption and with design thinking. It requires recognizing the power of startups and emerging tech companies. A significant percentage of the top 100 startups in Silicon Valley are led by Canadians. I was just there and met a lot of them. Many of whom are, as it happens, from the humanities. Startups are not only ends in themselves that can create marketable products, they're far more. They're a way of developing a mindset for engaging the world. Some of you might have seen the University Affairs article back in March on this. University of Toronto's Creative Destruction Labs is a thriving example. The Globe and Mail had a cover story back on March 18th about that. Connectivity requires a full court press on work integrated learning, internships and co-ops. These are not just passing fads at the undergraduate and at the graduate levels. Bridging internationally in research, student recruitment, and study abroad opportunities. Many of you know the statistic here, countrywide, 3% of our post-secondary students take advantage of the study abroad opportunities that all of their institutions have, and exactly 3% of our students take advantage of the ones that we have. And engaging our students and researchers with our alumni. It requires positioning graduate degrees to lead to many opportunities other than the academic workplace and supporting students to develop cross-functional ability, communication skills, and learning agility. In other words, the ability to move outside of one's area of expertise. It requires supporting and listening to our new faculty and to our students. In the past 10 years, we have renewed 60% of our faculty complement. In the past 10 years, we've renewed 60% of our faculty complement. We renew a high percentage of our students, of course, every year. New faculty and our students are interdisciplinary-minded, community-engaged, 
impatient with institutional barriers, looking for ways to connect with the world and with each other, and in many, many cases, startup oriented. They're creatures of connectivity. If we do not support and listen to our new faculty and our students, we will lose potential faculty talent to the profit sector before they ever even come to the university. And we will fail in our stated mission to prepare students for enriching careers as engaged global citizens. Finally, what else can we do to move forward on connectivity? Capitalize on two things. The fact that we are one of the most multidisciplinary universities in the country with 17 colleges and schools and the fact that as our vision document states, we use interdisciplinary and collaborative approaches to discovery. Interdisciplinarity itself is not a goal. It's a means to an end to meet those global challenges that I listed earlier. The world's greatest challenges won't be met by a single researcher in a single discipline, but by many researchers in many disciplines combining forces. There are many reasons we were the only university in the country to be successful in both CFREF competitions. There are many reasons for that. But one is that we already have here interdisciplinary strength. Global water security, as an example, involves every one of our six signature areas, every single one of them. Aboriginal peoples, agriculture, energy and mineral resources, One Health, synchrotron sciences, and of course, water security. Each signature area of research itself is deliberately interdisciplinary. The premise of each of our graduate schools is that it is interdisciplinary. The concept behind the health sciences is that it is interdisciplinary. Toxicology is interdisciplinary. The Wilson Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, Arts and Science, unique in the country. Nursing's clinical skills labs, the design of the health sciences building, of the collaborative science building. All of these are interdisciplinary. The Interdisciplinary Center for Culture and Creativity is interdisciplinary. A school of architecture will be interdisciplinary. Agriculture and bioresources is interdisciplinary. So is SWITCH, the Student Wellness, in Wellness Initiative Toward Community Health. Medicine and Computer Science, you would have seen this article in OCN recently, are collaborating to improve medical imaging. Indigenous ways of knowing are interdisciplinary. We need to make the most of this campus-wide tendency by being purposeful about establishing interdisciplinary and inquiry-based programming and research among our academic units. We need to build it into our students' earliest university experiences. That's a tough challenge. Build it into their earliest experiences. It involves critical thinking, but it also demands horizontal thinking, applying what you learn in one discipline to what you need in another discipline. We need to build on our various successes in this area so that it becomes explicit, not just implicit in our culture. And by constantly imagining ways of restructuring ourselves through connectivity, not along predictable disciplinary lines to drive this. I'll finish with this then. The next integrated plan is a timely opportunity for us to do this on a university-wide scale. It presents the perfect opportunity to create an interdisciplinary culture internally and to respond to the external challenges people believe we are here to meet. In sum, to practice throughout the university the connectivity that drives our vision and that will be one of the cornerstones of the integrated plan along sustain, alongside sustainability and diversity and creativity. So these are the matters the president deems important and offered by one who owes the university and all of you everything I've got. Thank you very much.